talking about a subject which neither this university nor any other teachers, the art of being a couple, because it is one of those subjects which, to which there's no easy answer and no formula, and therefore I am not going to tell you um, a quick solution to the problems of your life, but I want to take this because it is one of the biggest problems of all, and it's going to get a bigger, becoming a bigger problem because we are going to live for 90 years or 100 years now, and women are becoming educated and no longer willing to shut up and do what they're told. <laughs> And uh, we've, um, we're faced by uh, people from many different countries and civilizations and everything is changing. And so I um, would like to just suggest what I am trying to do, which is not to provide an answer, but to explore. And I, if you ask me who I am, I would say I have become um, after being an academic and so on, an explorer. An explorer of what we can do, which we have not yet done. And let me give you a way of starting this. I had a conversation um, once with a, one of the senior ayatollahs of Iran. And for an hour, he was furious with me. And he shouted and said how angry he was with the Americans and with the British and with the West and how they didn't and were insulting him and so on. And then after an hour, suddenly his anger vanished and he smiled and he hugged me and he said, I want to come again. And I said, why? And he said, because you listened to me. And the question is, do we listen to each other? And I think we have never been taught to talk to each other because in the past we were taught rhetoric, which was how to persuade other people to do what we wanted and how to talk beautifully and uh, conventionally. But um, now um, we have to know not only how to listen to others, but also to fight the obstacle which our human nature places in the way of understanding what others say. Because when I listen to someone, my brain immediately rejects everything which seems irrelevant and only absorbs what I agree with. And it requires great effort to find meaning in what people are saying and uh, that means that we have to train ourselves to communicate with others in ways which we have not been accustomed to, because in the past the important thing in, in a conversation was to say what people expected you to say, not to offend them, and so on. And I've been devoting my, most of my life just to listening to people, and listening not only to the living, but also to the dead. Because one of the snags of being a modern person is that a modern person is supposed to forget the past and um, think only how one can improve on the past. But the, the very latest um, scientific work on the memory reveals that you cannot have ideas about the future unless you have rich memories. You can, your memories, the extent of your memories determines how much you can imagine about the future. And if you get dementia or you lose your memory, you can't think about the future. But the 20th century has bequeathed to us this idea that you should concentrate on the memories of your own childhood. And I feel that if we want to know about the future, if we want to have an idea of what we would like in the future, we need to um, expand our memories and discover the memories of others. And so I spend my time discovering what people have in their heads. And the great mystery 
of our time for me is what goes on in other people's heads. And uh, how, can, how, how can one discover this? In ordinary pleasant conversation, people do not say what they really think. Uh, in business, you've got to conceal as much as to reveal. Um, and you've got to keep up your reputation. And it is particularly uh, difficult that men do not seem to be able to talk very well with women. And women are constantly complaining that there are subjects men don't listen. And so we have to reinvent the way we talk. And uh, instead of talking to just the people who are around us, I think the first introduction to it is to talk to complete strangers. Because with complete strangers, one can, in fact, um, say things which one wouldn't say to others. And so what I've done is, as you may know, I've um, been organizing conversations in which I give people a menu which has 25 questions and which um, gives you subjects to talk about. And these are the most difficult subjects that can be thought of. You know, what, are, what have been your priorities in the past and what could they be in the future? Now, this requires a lot of thinking. What are you afraid of? And this requires a lot of thinking because fear is something that we have um, been unable to liberate ourselves from. It is all very well for politicians and little theorists to say man is born free. No, no creature is born free from fear. And how do you overcome fear? I think um, this is the great challenge which we have. And uh, for me, the way to overcome fear is to take fear, everything one is afraid of, into little parts and look at each part separately in the same way as a physicist would take part, uh, part the objects in the universe and look at small things and therefore becoming, looking at the world in a microscopic way. And in the natural world, we have done this. We now say this is not a chair, this is a um, made up of electrons and molecules and so on. And it's the same with all the thoughts that other people have. And when one looks at people as being made up of a mass of different elements, those elements become interesting instead of being a menace. And so I put people why I, when I invite people, I invite you to come and meet. And I'd say, do you know this person? No. All right, here's your partner for the next two hours. And here are things to talk about. And it is amazing the reactions that I've had from this. And people say they are hungry for proper conversation about a serious subject. And the pub is no good because you know, all the... the uh, um, inquiries about pubs, people say that in pubs you talk about nothing in particular. And really you talk in private to your partner most openly, but even there it's difficult. And uh, I recall doing this, I've done this with uh, organizations, companies, universities, um, the, the homeless people, um, every sort. And I remember once doing it with the police, and the police invited all their members and their, their leaders of the community. And the chief inspector, the chief and superintendent of police said at the end of it that he talked to somebody who he'd known for 20 years because they worked in the same office in the same place. And in these two hours, he learned more about him than he learned in 20 years. In other words, we're moving around in a world we don't know. And that is why for me, the if I ask myself, you know, what is the purpose of life, you know, this impossible question. Well, I conclude for me, it is to discover the world and to, dis to discover what it is that I can give the world which it doesn't have, doesn't have already. 
And in order to discover the world, I need to talk to as many people as possible. And then I need to see as many as possible. And uh, I have been doing this, and as I say, with the, with the past as well as the present, in order to see that we do not devote our lives to just to repeating the mistakes of the past. And uh, what is the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake is that we have now reached a stage where work no longer suits us. We've become educated. Um, we have greater ambitions to see the world and to discover what life is about. And work is becoming more stressful. And um, many, I think almost most, occupations are in crisis. And uh, they don't know what to do with themselves. And people are unwilling to work harder and harder. The more you climb up, the more you work. And therefore, my ambition is to see how we can reinvent new kinds of work. And this is not a mad idea, because every time the world's population has exploded, we have invented, humans have invented a new kind of work. They invented agriculture. They then invented industry when there were too many people in agriculture. They invented um, the service society. They invented public employment. And now we have to invent a new kind of work for the billion people who are um, coming into the world and who either don't have jobs or don't have jobs which will use all their talents and give them everything they would like in order to become fully alive instead of 20% alive, 50% alive. And uh, I've been doing this by having experiments. I uh, explore, I go into a supermarket and I say, let us turn this supermarket into a cultural center. Let us introduce, and I've done this, um, say, let us uh, give lessons to, music lessons to children who come shopping following their parents. Let us uh, give uh, English lessons to uh, migrants who can't speak the language. Let us have uh, conversations among the, the customers who never speak to each other. And I go into, I, I've been, I get invited to places like uh, insurance companies, the last place you think that um, anything can be changed. And uh, I want to say that insurance is about fear. Now, how can we assuage your fears and how can we, can we increase your fears so that you insure more and more things? And uh, what people really want from insurance is opportunity. And all the people who insure themselves have got things they have got to say, have things they have said which they could give to young people. And so I'm talking about opportunity insurance rather than catastrophe insurance. And I've been into hotel chains, and in hotels, um, the women who come as chambermaids are often uh, from other countries, they want to learn a language. Why can't a hotel be a place which is also a language school? Why can't it enable its, um, its, its customers, its clients, to meet people in the city instead of just watching CNN on, on their telly? Um, there are all sorts of changes which are possible to invent in the way we work. And this is what I um, would like people to collaborate with us um, and see whether in their particular um, employment there is a little part which can be devoted to research and development of how work can be made to suit us rather than to suit industrial purposes. This, I think, is the big um, challenge and revolution we, we can imagine in the next 50 years. And it's one which we can stimulate because um, young people are going to be increasingly reluctant to work for jobs which are not appealing and that this is an alternative to talking about the alter alternative life instead of going to the Hebrides and uh, living as one did in the 10th century. This is an opportunity to um, try something out and fail. And I, um, when I talk of myself and explore, I, I, I insist that we can't expect experiments to succeed. When this electric light was invented, it took uh, thousands 
of failed experiments before we invented electricity. Why are we not inventing things and, being, and accepting that they will fail? And uh, so the, uh, the, what I want to do now is to invite everybody to not only to talk to someone else, but also to write a little passport showing what they want other people to understand about them. I am, believe that very few people, in fact, almost nobody feels they're properly understood. And it is very difficult even to understand oneself. And at present, the great, uh, you're being urged always to, um, uh, to, to know yourself. I think it's impossible to know oneself. I think it's much more interesting to know others. I'm quite bored to know who I am and I don't know who I am. And knowing others is what life is about. And uh, I see us doing in effect what, something like what William the Conqueror did when he came into England. He said, let us know who owns the land in England because land was the only thing that mattered in those days. And I would, I would say we need a new doomsday book now who is it who inhabits the world? Tell me who you are. And we can only tell it in interaction, in conversations, and we will record what you say, and we will put it up, if you like, anonymously, but in order, because the one thing that you have is a personal experience. You can see the world as no one else does. And what I see is not what you see, and it is by the conjunction of all what each one sees that one can discover something like the truth. So this is how I see what I, how I would like to spend my life, discovering the world and then seeing what I can offer. And I would like to know what you think. And it is my um, belief that there's no good in me having a desire if all of you don't want to do this. And if you find there are all sorts of obstacles. But uh, we can try. And if you will now tell me what you think, that would be interesting. Thank you.